Well, with the last session, apparently we broke the sound barrier. Yeah. Well, I do remember I was in uh, Southern California in the 50s when they started breaking the sound barrier, and it used to break our windows. We get cracks in our windows. Did anyone have that experience? Well, you know, it's the aerospace industry, right? And so um, I would say that if, if uh, this breaking the sound barrier put cracks in our windows in the 50s, that the message uh, put cracks in the foundations. And so, yes, in the foundations of patriarchy. So with me, I don't know that we're going to continue on that same high, because I think right now we're going to take our hammer and our peg and we're going to do some heavy construction. Yay! Okay? <laughs> We're gonna do we're gonna do some groundwork here, and so I'm, I'm I love to tell jokes and ad lib, but I'm gonna try to keep it a little bit down because I have some very important things to say. Um, so I'm gonna start with a with a story about the journey about the symbol of the veil, in, in ancient Near East and today, and it's not supposed to be shame or honor. It's supposed to be subjuga uh, subjugation or honor. That's what the comparison is. Is the veil about subjugation, that is submission, or is it about honor? That's what I'm going to address. So uh, at McMaster, Uni uh, McMaster Divinity College is associated with McMaster University, and that's an institution that's known for its large number of Islamic students. Sometimes they call us the Brown Campus. Um, several years ago, I ran across a student working in the university library. She was clearly westernized, very attractive and outgoing, and uh, but she was wearing a hijab. And when she said, all righty then, what else can I do for you? I asked if I could ask her a personal question, and she dimpled and said yes. And I s asked her if it was her choice to wear a hijab or if her parents insisted on it or forced her to do it. It's a, you know, it's a good question, kind of question we would ask if we, if we were brave enough, right? Well, I'm, I'm brave enough. <laughs> so she said, <laughs> I said I wasn't going to add lib. Oh, she, d she said, I'm glad you asked that. And she um, launched into a description and she said, this is entirely my choice. My parents, my mother, my family, no one wears a hijab. But when I became 12 years old, men from my culture started stalking me and making improper propositions to me. That's when I put on a, a hijab. That's when I started wearing a veil. But, uh, and so she said, and then it stopped. No longer was I stalked. No longer was I treated like a sexual object. And now I wear it all the time. I even wear it when we have family parties in the home. And my grandma says, honey, Take off that veil. And she says, no, Grandma, I'm not going to do it. I will not do it. A couple of years later, I, I participated in the, the floor, ground floor of a project that's currently going on of a survey uh, that is asking Muslim women why they choose to veil. And I'm cooperating with my daughter, who's a professor of political science at Virginia Westland. So, uh, so I gathered these five women, Muslim women, from five different countries together, and they all said, we chose to veil, our parents did not want us to do it, but we did it against our authorities because it was our choice. After sharing with us freely about their reasons, saying some of the very same things the librarian had said, and a couple of other reasons that I probably didn't, wasn't so enamored with, they asked my daughter and I pleadingly, if we understood their reasons. And I was compelled to say, yes, yes I do. And that was a part of a long journey towards a paradigm shift in my understanding of the veil in, in 1 Corinthians 11. Our current understanding of the veil in 1 Corinthians 11, 3 through 16 has been dominated by the interpretation of male scholars uh, with a Western worldview who have no cultural context uh, with, with which to either interpret the symbol of the veil or to understand the function of the veil in the contemporary cultures today that veil, such as Islam, but many, many more veil, choose to veil. And they don't understand this particularly from the women's point of view. It, it, it's like Dominique said, we and they 
don't have the appropriate cultural background to understand the text. And so when, our under, when we understand this cultural symbol more accurately, uh, our interpretation of the passage is going to change. We've all found this to be true. Context is extremely important. So I'm going to give a couple of disclaimers. First of all, don't misunderstand me. I'm not supporting Islam in my argument. I'm not trying to pressure or persuade women to veil in our culture. Um, and uh, now that I better understand, though, the symbol and the patterns of thinking and practice around it, if I were in Corinth in the first century, I would veil. I'd wear a veil. Um, and the second disclaimer is because the passage is so weird, it's gotten a variety of egalitarian interpretations. So I'm thinking primarily Phil Payne, Alan Paget, and Ken Bailey all have different interpretations of what veiling means in this passage. And I, I so hate to, to sound like I'm disrespecting anybody. Um, uh, Phil Payne concentrates on the, the grammar and the vocabulary in his analysis. Alan Paget um, focuses on the force of certain parts of the argument. He says, he says, this passage is saying something good about women. And I'm so glad he said it. He's so right. But I don't agree with his basic stand. Now, Kim Bailey it, uh, it was going at the issue from the sociocultural context and then understanding the text within the sociocultural context. But he, of, of all people, knows extremely well. I'm standing behind Ken Bailey's interpretation, and then I'm giving it a bit of a, of a, of a not even a nudge, I'm giving it a shove. You'll hear some stuff today that hasn't yet been said in public yet. It's in my book, um, but it has not been said outside of studies and discussions. It's a new thought that you're going to get today. I think you probably are getting a hint of where I'm going. So, actually I can't see this. The first question I want you to entertain is how would a first generation Christian woman interact with the sexual environment in Corinth? How would she do it? Pardon me? Yeah, yes, yes, you hide, precisely, because what was going on? The women that Paul wrote in Corinth were first generations believers who belonged to the Christian community because of their own convictions about the gospel. How would a woman who were among the first Gentile believers to come to repentance and faith in Christ and commit themselves to the Christian community interact with the sexual environment in Corinth? Now, according to Rodney Stark and the rise of Christianity, such women were generally attracted to, to Christianity in part because of its high standard of ethics, particularly in regards to sexuality, because Corinth had a reputation for being a wild city. It was in a strategic military commercial location because it controlled the overland movement between Italy and Asia. Consequently, it was known for its wealth, religious temples and rites, and its vice, particularly for its sexual vice. It was a place that offered every kind of sexual experience available to men. And I do say men, I'm not being inclusive. Uh, so to act like a Corinthian was to engage in sexual immorality, and the term Corinthian girl was a euphemism for a prostitute. That's right. There was no, really no upper class, but instead a class of nouveau riche that was, uh, that was created from Corinth's new prosperity. However, Paul indicates that the Corinthian church did not draw its membership primarily from the wealthy elite, but mostly from those who lacked status or power. However wild Corinth was, and however sexually permissive the Gentile culture, culture, there was a double standard for women in both the Greek and Roman society. It's difficult to recreate with confidence what kinds of freedom would be available to or chosen by women in, in Corinth who are not slaves or prostitutes in this morally vol volatile context. How would women act and dress when they are going to church on Moulin Rouge, for instance? In such settings, it's common for re uh, respectable women to cover up more than normal. It is likely that a woman who is a first generation believer in this context, or is it likely, I guess the question is that, is it likely that a woman who is a first generation believer in this context would flout 
Roman morality for, for women, let alone Christian morality? Would she be throwing off her veil? in the Corinthian house church? Or is it more plausible that they would be more careful and resistant to risking exposure and vulnerability even in the house church? Uh, what would, and, and furthermore, what would happen if the low status Corinthian house church included women who were freed women, slaves, or prostitutes? Because we will see that freed women, slaves, and prostitutes were forbidden to veil in the culture. It is assumed by most scholars that women were flouting the convention of wearing the veil in the house church because they did not want to submit and they were being rebuked and corrected by Paul. Now, what's the consequence of this idea? The consequence is of this idea is the chilling idea that if women refused to submit, Paul wanted the men to humiliate them grab them and shave their hair off, take their glory away and devalue uh, them further. That would be the implications of the argument if you take this seriously. But in the situation in Corinth, together with the dress code issue and the formal features of the text, uh, it, it suggests that there are more plausible contexts than have been typically explored for, uh, for, the, for this passage. The next question, what was involved in the practice of veiling in the Mediterranean world? Jennifer Heath, the editor of a book titled The Veil, Women Writers on, it, Women Writers on Its History, Lore, and Politics, asserts flatly, the veil is vastly misunderstood. It is important to establish what the head covering meant for women in the Greco-Roman culture and what it meant uh, to, for a woman to have an uncovered head. The veil was and is a cultural icon, and only a culture that veils knows what it really means. According to Kenneth Bailey, in, the tra in traditional Middle Eastern society, from the days of the Jewish rabbis to the present, a woman was and is obliged to cover her hair in public. In her discussion of the background of veiling in Islam, Lila Ahmed states, the rules on veiling, specifying which women must veil and which could not, were carefully detailed in Assyrian law. The veil served not merely to mark the upper classes, but more fundamentally, to differentiate between respectful women and those who were publicly available, that is, available sexually, those who could be accosted and harassed and raped. That is, use of the veil classified women according to their sexual activity and, singled men and signaled to men which women were under male protection and which were fair game. Assyrian law required aristocratic wives, daughters, and concubines to wear veils, but prostitutes and slaves were forbidden to ve uh, wear veils. Similar, similar rules applied in the Hellenist period and continued much later during the spread of Islam. The first Roman emperor, Octavian, tried to legislate modesty in the same way uh, so that elite Roman women were required to uh, dress their hair in public under a stola. However, across the cultures, including the Roman culture, the veil was also implied as a sacred vehicle or an indication of devotion. In biblical studies, much discussion is devoted to the style of the veil. The fact that styles seem to vary in paintings and statues had left some to suggest that we cannot have confidence in exactly what Paul meant by the Greek words that have traditionally been interpreted as wearing a veil in 1 Corinthians 11. However, the practice, assumptions, and rationale behind the requirements to veil in the Eastern Mediterranean are amazingly consistent over, over a long stretch of time. So while we know that there was a diversity in styles like you see above, according to regions and time periods, just like there is today, we can know something about the symbol and function of a head covering in the Eastern Mediterranean with some confidence, since using some form of head covering was a widespread practice and a moral requirement among women in early Christianity, rabbinic Judaism, and Islam in this area. It usually concealed the hair, much like the head covering worn in the hijab, but styles varied. And so you can look up there. I was trying to remember the five women. The five women each had a different style of hijab. Um, one of them wore a designer 
uh, handkerchief. Uh, I think that's very common in Egypt to wear actually a designer scarf that is an enhancement and extremely expensive, while um, women from other areas wear as, as plain a hijab as possible. And then there was one woman who actually did have rosettes on her hijab and matching rosettes on her, um, I think it was a sweater that matched her hijab. So there's just all kinds of different ways of doing this. And different things were being expressed by them. But that didn't mean that the, the basic rationale for all of them was the same. So, so the next question is, in what ways then does the Western worldview misunderstand the ancient and modern practice of veiling? In traditional biblical studies, most have assumed that veiling in 1 Corinthians 11 meant submission or subjugation without delving into understanding the meanings that veiling had for women in the ancient near uh, and the ancient Eastern Mediterranean culture or in its continued widespread use in a number of modern cultures. Uh, in Aphrodite's uh, tortoise, it says that veiling has accumulated a lot of sociopolitical baggage. It's assumed that by Westerners that, that the veil is and was always understood by everyone as an institutional form of oppression and subjugation of women in Islam and that women of all times would resist submitting to such symbols if they had the opportunity. But it is also used to highlight female sexuality in things, like the concept of oriental hedonism behind the veil, you know, Dance of the Seven Veils, with stories of kidnapping, harems, and scandal. So the sexuality of the veil is brought out. And finally, it's associated with the image of terrorism, of Muslim fundamentalism, and the Islamic threat to the West. So one of the, just a darling girl, who is who, uh, Muslim girl who we interviewed said, yeah, every once in a while when I'm walking down the street, someone yells at me, terrorist! And I'd say, oh, there's something to talk about. <laughs> so this is with us. In addition, in biblical studies, the text has been influenced by 20th century Western women's resistance to the, the veil, the hat, um, and other forms of traditional apparel. Now, in Iran in the 20th century, when the culture was westernized, women were required to move their veils. But when conservative Islam came back into power, they were required to veil again. The resistance of some women against submitting to the veil seemed to be paradigmatic of the resistance of the women in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 11. However, the fact that many Iranian uh, women first vehemently resisted removing their veil is overlooked partly because their experience was not part of the public discourse until much later. Of course, the Western world wasn't interested in discussing that part. The, co the course of feminism in the Western world and certain practices in the 1960s and perhaps in the 70s, I don't know, was 60s in California, such as burning the bra, seems to have parallels to the apparent rebellion of women against similar restrictions in clothing that have been interpreted as sig uh, signaling the subordinate status of women as a class. Um, uh, there was a, one, of, one of my friends had said, you know, when I read that passage, I always thought about girls in the parochial school, you know, rolling their dresses up so they were mini, you know, their, those plaid skirts up so they were mini skirts. That's what it seemed to me. Yeah. So, however, we now have access to women's narratives from cultures who veil that tell another story. It's really not like a parochial Catholic school. We find that there is a strong current of pious fundamentalist women in Islam and Judaism who choose to veil for reasons that sound quite similar to Paul's rationale in 1 Corinthians 11. However, we are not completely dependent on an anthropological parallels that run the risk of being anachronistic. The story of women who refuse to move the veil and the reasons for wearing it may be traced back to a Syrian culture. A fuller understanding of the, of the function of the veil in the Eastern Mediterranean results in a coherent reading of a passage that has confounded interpreters who assume they know the context of the situation, they know the topic, and they know the purpose of what Paul said, they just can't make sense of the text. In following the argument from point to point, Right? We all know this, right? We've read this passage. And, and part of the problem is they mistranslate it. We'll talk about that in a minute. What is the rationale behind veiling? This is very important, and I only can spend so much time on it. There's so much you can say. Except 
adopted conventions for the respectable dress of Roman matrons, together with the widespread practice of head covering in the eastern areas of the empire, including Palestine, is most likely the basis for Paul's argument. Paul's concern appears to extend to any woman in the congregation who might prophesy, prophecy and pray. I can't say, is it prophesy and pray or prophecy and prophesy and pray? Anyway, Paul even would want someone who is unmarried, single, and the widows to cover their head. He just didn't want the matrons to cover their head. So the matrons' dress code signified rank as well as status and role as a sexually mature woman in Roman society. Now, Paul supports that basically by saying that an uncovered head represents a woman being disgraced in a manner similar to having her head shaved which destroyed her appearance and therefore her value in the culture. This meaning of an uncovered head was shared by Roman law, which stated that if a woman was not dressed like a matron, including wearing a veil binding or binding her hair, and a man tried to seduce her or accost her, he wasn't liable for prosecution or assault, because she was signaling he could. This is also consistent with the convention that a woman's hair was sexually arousing. And, you know, today the, the Muslim men will say, you know, if I see an uncovered head, I just can't control myself. Um, and, and, you know, that, that a woman's beauty had that kind of power. So showing one's hair was interpreted as a solicitation or availability. It was provocative. And that view is prevalent then. Read about it then, read about it now, it's still there in the Middle East. But this is partly because a woman's hair was considered to be the chief element of her beauty. Well, I was talking to two male TAs about this. Here's one of my ad libs, right? I was talking to two male TAs about this and saying, yeah, then it was a part of their beauty. And, and in the Western world, we just don't get that. And they said, think again, Cindy. And I said, what? They said, how much money do you spend on your haircut? I said, I said, all the women we know spend an awful lot of money taking care of their hair. And they say, say I'm not sure it's changed so very much. People still think that hair is an, an, a chief element of beauty, and that's why we give it so much attention. Well, this explains why Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 11 that a woman's long hair was her glory. And now I'm going to do a little twist for you that none of you have heard. But I think when he says that the long hair is the glory of a woman, and then he said it's given to her as a cloak or a covering, you think about the register I'm in. I'm in, I'm in okay, beauty and their hair, and enhancement, and they get it as a cloak. I'm thinking that it's a beauty accessory, like a pert. You know, so your hair is like your beauty accessory, because it is. It's exactly how we treat it. So I think that's what that means. And at the same time, he could argue that she should cover it up, because that was the thing that was always confusing, right? How can your long hair be your glory and a cloak given to you, and then why would you cover it up? Doesn't make sense. Oh, until you understand how the culture's thinking. Then it makes sense. He argues that he wants all women to cover their hair while praying and prophesying, even those who are not allowed to veil in the culture, such as female slaves. The worship service in the house church was not the time or place to signal availability to the men. <laughs> yeah. Tell some of our worship leaders. Yeah. Not, not anybody here. <laughs> And traditionally, across the various cultures of the Roman Empire, women prayed in churches with their heads covered. In common with other members of his culture, Paul thought hair was sexy or a means of attraction. And the way he describes it is strange with the other literature because he's positive about it. He goes, yeah, great, hair's a glory. Because usually they're saying, oh, it's so shameful that they're so attractive. You know, but he's actually quite positive, and that's what Alan Paget sees. He sees that he sees that they're positive, and it's really in contrast with the other literature. But a modest and chaste woman's beauty was not supposed to be on public display, but was supposed to be only shown to her husband or her closest relatives when, who weren't supposed to be thinking about her sexually. In summary, a woman's hair represented her feminine beauty, and the way she dressed her hair represented her honor. Beauty and honor both reflected the range of meaning of doxa, that is glory, and allows for Paul's extensive wordplay in this passage. Covered hair in public represented modesty, honor, status, and protection for a woman, and an uncovered head disgraced a woman and put her sexually at risk. 
same thing today in certain cultures that veil. Possi what are the possible reasons that the members of the Corinthian church may have wanted to restrict ba uh, veiling? Because somebody wants to. Paul's instructions were that all women should veil when they pray and prophesy, which was not the cultural practice. The members of the Corinthian house church could have wanted to restrict veiling in ways that were consistent with the culture. Veils were not usually worn in the home and the Christian community met in the homes. Or they may have wanted to retrain the cultural restrictions against veiling and not allow lower class women or slaves to veil. Well, I'm going to leave it with that. Um, I have a lot I could talk about, about how you could build a theology of, around the household and say, well, yeah, I'm just going to add libits here, where, where some of the Corinthian men could say, women, we're all at home here, and we're all family. Don't we call each other's brothers and sisters, so why don't you take it off? And what would you say? I know what I'd say. I'd say, in your dreams, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> or, and this was the thing I really thought it was. I really thought that was wh what was going on with the home church. But the more I think about it, the more I sadly think it might be the other thing is that there were men in the sl possibly having who had slaves in the church who were resistant to the slaves and the freed women um, and the prostitutes if there are prostitutes in the church veiling it's the same thing that Mimi was talking about with um, Catherine Bushnell when um, Catherine Bushnell was going to court and that big group of men were going to attack her why were they going to attack her same reason that the Corinthians men wanted to keep the women unveiled. And it might not, they might not have admitted, no, we want to have sex with those women and we don't want them to signal their availability. Or we plan to have sex with them when we get home, which would be in the culture what was done. Or I want my uncle to. Or, you know, she's got to be available to all the men. That I don't, but my, the men that visit. What about the rest of the slaves? Who are they going to sleep with? You know, the same kinds of logic that Catherine Bushnell was dealing with, they would be dealing with in terms of slave owners and, and s women slaves in the church. And you've got to kind of start turning your mind around the idea that, wow, there were women slaves in the church, and women slaves had absolutely no protection. And, and, uh, and they were forbidden by law to wear a veil because that was protection. And so these guys, they could have, had, they could have been wanting to breed slaves. Any, any number of these things are, are reasons. So it's more coherent if it's, it, it, the passage becomes more coherent if it's assumed that the Corinthian women were refusing to wear their head coverings or veils or that the freed women and slaves wanted to come to church and not be that person who is available sexually to every man who sees her. And so it becomes more, but, but, but that they were being pressured to not wear it or they were not being allowed to wear it by men in the house church makes sense. And a similar scenario is repeated twice in Hebrew literature when uh, Queen Vashti refused King Xerxes' order to come out of the harem and display her beauty to his banquet of prominent military and political leaders. And she said no. And Susanna's veil was removed against her will by her authorities, two corrupt Jewish elders in Susanna 1, 31 through 33. Now, Susanna was a woman of great refinement and beautiful in appearance. As she was veiled, the scoundrels, scoundrels, ordered her to be unveiled so that they might feast their eyes on her beauty, you know? So those who were with her and all who saw her were weeping because it was terrible. It was a terrible thing to do. So Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 11 could sound corrective and confrontational to women if one presumes Western values and behavior, but the language and grammar do not demand it. It is rather explaining the rationale. Paul is recognizing that a woman, if a woman takes off her veil, she might as well have a, a shaved head because she has been shamed. Pious women in the culture who are concerned with their reputation would agree with that assessment, and they would be resistant to exposing themselves to shame. In addition, in this culture, men were the ones who relegated, regulated veiling in their own interests, and they were most likely to object to an unqualified woman, such as a slave, wearing a veil in church, and, and would require from Paul, give me a theological justification. So, do you want me to continue, or shall I cut this short? Keep going? Keep going? Okay. Evidence, we're, we're going to talk about, where am I here? 
Okay, so I didn't give you, there's that. Oh, this is when you can't see this. There's the pivotal. Okay, sorry about that. Evidence that the women did not want to remove their veils. The lax environment in Corinth, the repute reputed presence of large number of prostitutes, Paul's concerns about male sexual behavior and possible broad-minded sexuality in the congregation indicates a potentially unsafe environment for women, you think? According to 1 Corinthians 1.26, they said there, the women were not, would not be from the elite classes and the lower class women would be in those vulnerable situations and less likely to say, take risks by sending potentially dangerous signals. So I suggest the kind of Gentile woman who was a first generation convert to, Judy, uh, to Christianity or Judaism would want to be pious according to the culture standard for women. She would tend to be more influenced by Roman, Roman law's depiction and protection of the high status of a modest woman. In other words, the Corinthian women's behavior and values would reflect the double standard between men and women that was prevalent in the Greco-Roman world. On the other hand, the Corinthian men, who are arguably broad-minded about their own sexual behavior in Corinth and in the culture at large, would be more exposed to any trends in public and influenced by them. Some of the men could have been quite interested in including the women in the congregation who are not their relatives to pray and prophesy without a veil and easily find a theological basis for it. The reading that women could be refusing to remove their head coverings in the house church not only fits the historical behavior of pious women, but it better, ca but it better accounts for two features in the passage. And in 1 Corinthians 11.10, Paul writes, because of this, a woman should have authority over her head. Now, in some of our Bibles, it says, because of this, a woman should have, and then it has in italics, a symbol of authority over her head. Dis uh, what the Greek says is, a, a, because of this, a woman should have authority over her head. So one translation, which is literal, says a woman's supposed to have authority over her own head, and the translation that has been favored, particularly in, in recent translations, has said a woman ought to be under authority and have a symbol on her head that shows she's under authority. Well, that's a difference. I don't understand why this isn't a scandal. <laughs> Honestly. Why are we not addressing this and yelling about this? This is terrible. This is really, really making scripture say the opposite of what it's supposed to say. But they're so convinced they know what this is about. They are so convinced. And so if you take the literal reading, you say, yeah, women want to cover their head and they ought to have the authority to do it, period. And Paul's coming behind women and he's supporting them. He's supporting women and he doesn't want them to be shamed or disgraced. And that's why he says, he goes, well, just lest you misunderstand my argument, women aren't independent of men. Remember, you know how it says that? And you say, why does he say that at that point? It's because he's supporting them and saying, no, it's not what you men are saying. It's what they are saying. That's what they're going to do. And, and so here we have a place in the Bible where he's actually saying women have the right of it. He's not really saying, oh, is he not saying, though, that men are in the wrong? Because there is that other formal issue. So th there's evidence, there, I said there were two formal features that, that, that showed that probably it wasn't women that were the problem. One of them is he says, give them authority over their head. Give them authority, let them do it. And then the other one is a grammatical masculine that shows that the problem makers were, well, certainly weren't alone women. You can't be totally, totally uh, rigid about this, but there is evidence that men were the ones that could have restricted billing in the text. So there's this other formal feature, um, and that is when you get to 1116, Paul throws down a last challenge who are against women covering their heads. He says, if anyone wants to be argumentative about this, right, if anyone wants to fight, <laughs> then we have no other practice. Now, if Paul had wanted to correct women's behavior, one would have expected the, abje uh, the adjective to be feminine, the feminine singular, rather than a masculine singular. But it is a masculine singular. Now, in the idiom of the Greek language, the masculine singular may be used for a woman, particularly in formulaic phrases, but this is not a formulaic phrase. It is grammatically odd if Paul was targeting women as he's read as doing. He probably is targeting men. And the thing about it is, is that in the culture, the practice of veiling and its restrictions were regulated by men. 
throughout the Greco-Roman world. So it makes far more sense that men would be raising the questions and suggesting restrictions on veiling when it is understood that Paul's directive for all women to veil was not the cultural practice. So the likelihood of conflict with the men in this area is much more apparent and much more likely. You can see it heading to a clash. Furthermore, Paul identifies arguing in anger in the church community as a gender-specific problem for men in 1 Timothy 2, right? He says, I want all men to pray without you know, arguing and anger. And this is actually highlighted as being, as for Paul, as far as he was concerned, it was a gender problem. Whereas for women, it was how they were dressing and other things that were going on in Ephesus. We're talking about Ephesus now in 1 Timothy. Uh, he highlighted anger and disputing as a, a basically a male issue. In contrast to that, women in the first century culture would have been extremely reluctant to have conversations with men that were not their husbands in a house church, let alone pick a fight with Paul. It's far more likely, right? And, and think about another thing. Remember in um, 1 Corinthians 14 and that interesting passage for women to keep silent? He says, it goes, you know, it's a shame for you to be talking while other people are talking in church. So if you have any questions about the theological discussion, ask your husband about them when they get home. Well, if the women are having trouble following the discussion in the house church, how are they going to follow this difficult theological discussion in 1 Corinthians 11? Uh, this theological discussion on veiling is geared towards men and their questions. The, uh, so the women who have difficulty following teaching because of their lower education, uh, they, needed their, they needed more basic questions than this to be answered. And generally speaking, like I say, in, in cultures that veil like this, where there's really no serious options, they're not asking the questions. Therefore, with the symbol of the... Is that my conclusion? Forget what I'm doing. Yes, that's the conclusion. Therefore, with the symbol of the veil, Paul does something really phenomenal. He equalizes the social relationships in the Christian community uh, between men and women because, um, and, and men and men, actually, because men, the veiling and prayer of men was a sign of high status, and he told them they couldn't veil between women because wearing the veil signaled honor and sexual purity uh, for all women now because it removes class distinctions. So the veil symbolized honor and virtue and most one women wanted to wear it because it was the thing that symbolized their value in the culture. And we could say, oh, it shouldn't be, they shouldn't be valued that way. It's like, but it, it, but it was. That's how it was. And if you were in it, you'd want to keep your veil on if it symboled your honor and your value. Paul is actually concerned that women should not be shamed or humiliated. So Paul's argument, so I, in my opinion, all the evidence goes towards, this is about Paul supporting women who choose to veil. 